Uh, you know, you well, us. our our first guest is Tafuku Zabiri. Tafuku. How do you say that, Tafuku? Listen to the lady now. <laughs> really? You're right, you're right. Okay. Listen to the lady, Tafuku Zubiri. Thank you, Tafuku, and welcome oh, back. Thank you very much. You're looking much. excellent, dude. Hey, you know what? I am trying to live so that oh. I can work hard to make it a better world. All right. Amen. <laughs> amen. 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 That's what we're all doing. Yes. Yeah. We're all trying it to stay is. healthy to do that, and you look it. Well, we met when I was. Uh, the subject of uh, your TV show, The History Detectives, and uh, I got a bunch of emails whether they were going to do the show or not, and they were looking for who had put out a poster that uh, read, Hot Town Pigs in the Streets, but the streets belong to the people. And uh, you tracked that poster back to me, we and um, I, uh, <laughs> I'm really glad you did, because a lot of people watch your show, mm -hmm. and all over the country I would get emails saying, hey, I just saw you on TV. a shy guy. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I can sorry, tell, but... you know. <laughs> But uh, so we've seen each other a couple times since then, um, and uh, it's always good to see you. You're full of energy. You're a happy guy. Uh, you're a serious man, and uh, I always love that you uh, ate breakfast at the Breakfast for Children at the Black Panther uh, operation in Oakland, California, and you went off to San Jose State and you ran track, which you also are a hell of an intellectual. And uh, you've got a new book coming out, or is it out already, called African it, Independence. It is available. People can order it. They can just type to kufuzuberi.com and they can order the book and the film. So, you know, we have a book and a documentary on African independence with the idea that the stories of freedom fighters, people who have fought against oppression, domination, exploitation of people, their stories need to be told. And, you know, and that goes back to our first meeting, I mean, because that's what we were doing. We're trying to tell the story of freedom fighters and freedom fighters here in the United States and how they were kind of not just telling uh, truth to power, but trying to provoke power to change and using truth in that kind of way, which requires a kind of organizational base. So off of that, what you just said, your, your journey into Africa to get this book has been many journeys, right? It's been so many journeys. I mean, I started going to Africa as an activist in the 70s, uh, talking to people who were still engaged in liberation struggles because we had... Because it was we, the 70s. It was the 70s, Jeez. and we had Zimbabwe, we had South Africa, we had, you know, places which had just gotten independence in Angola and in Mozambique, and so this really put us in good, um, good contact with freedom fighters then who were just trying to consolidate power you, and things of that nature. You didn't ever have the wonderful opportunity to meet Steve Biko, did you? I did not. Okay. I wish I was. The timing was just a little right. bit off, and I would have been very young had, yes, I, yes, had yeah. I encountered young, him, right. but it would have been a beautiful thing. Um, you know, I mean, I've met many African leaders and many African, current African heads of state uh, in the work that we've continued to do uh, in Africa. And uh, it has been my privilege to be able to sit with them and think about Africa's past and to kind of try to imagine how Africa can have a future which is not as a second-class place, you know. Now, the place is really not second-class. It's the people who have been rendered to second-class. Because mm -hmm. Africa is actually a very wealthy continent, and it's just the people that are poor. Tell us how big Africa is. I, I couldn't believe it when you talked about all the countries that could fit into Africa. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, this is the thing, and people forget that. The United States, boom. In Africa, China, boom, in Africa. So you get, you know, this large place, Russia, boom. And so Africa is tremendously large and it is gifted. I mean, the, 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 the process by which we live, modern society, could not effectively be done but for the resources out of Africa. So if you got a continent that is that rich, 
you have to ask the question, modern economy, in part based on the resources from Africa, yet the people in Africa are poor. Sounds like an inequitable relationship to me. Don't it? <laughs> uh, what do you think the, um, I, I'm sure you probably haven't had a chance to be back there since this visit, but I, I think it was fairly historic that um, Obama, uh, Obama's recent visit and, and the kind of conversations he had and also the kind of message that he Brought. It's important. It is important. It is important that Obama, as the first president, I mean, if we say Kennedy was an Irish president, you'd have to say Obama was an African no, president. No, Kennedy, or, Kennedy was, was a, a Catholic president. Okay. That was there, the first <laughs> president. there were other Irish guys. Okay. All right. Oh, there were other Irish guys. Okay. <laughs> so I'm just saying, if you said he was, he, he right. would have been. <laughs> but, I, but my thing is that I think Obama... Uh, you know, and, and, and I kind of try to look at these things realistically. And what could a president of the United States do in Africa? Because the United States as a country has misstepped in Africa every opportunity that it had. It participated in the slave trade. It participated in the colonization. colonization. It participated in the anti-independence movement. So, you know, this is the track record that the U.S. has. And so somebody has to break that and get on the side of history. Because the side of history is showing that Africans are gaining more and more freedom, more and more justice, more and more equality. That is really what's happening. So Africa, which has the fastest growing economies on the planet, mm -hmm. did you hear me? On the mm -hmm. planet Earth. So Africa is ripe and open for the opportunities of economic progress. It's just as the world stands, that economic progress is being captured in an inequitable relationship. And it's like no matter how much progress they make in Africa, they, they remain on the bottom in terms of their comparison with the rest of the world. In your introduction, you actually say the point to understand here is that the modern idea of Africa emerged in many ways from dehumanizing crucibles. That's right. That's right. And so, you know, our conversation about Africa is rather limited. And so the thing is, is that if you imagine what opportunities does Obama have. And so some of the things he did were, were good. You know, he renewed some of the stuff that was implemented by Bush. I know, by God, did I say that? Yes, you that did. Bush did better in Africa than Obama? Oh, no, <laughs> my God, Obama, tell me it ain't true. Show me it ain't true. Have you, you ever know met Obama? I mean? You're going to, he's going to talk to you about this <laughs> when he hears the show. Yeah. Yes. So, you know, the the... the I think it was an opportunity missed. I don't know what he's going to do later, but the message he's giving is not the message that really addresses the fundamental problems and issues that Africa has. And I think it's a opportunity that probably, if it is missed, who's going to do it if Obama didn't do it? Who's going to raise it if Obama didn't raise it? Who's going to kind of put it out there if Obama doesn't put it out there? One of the challenges you must have in covering a continent the size of Africa is that it's many different nations with many different cultural and ethnic and, and even in terms of independence movements, very different traditions. How does the current Africa, which you say is booming and emerging, going to avoid the perils of colonization in terms of what China, Russia, and for that matter, U.S. corporations might be trying to do with those rich resources today? That's an excellent question. That is an excellent question because that is That's the That's why issue. we have him. Yes. To ask those yes. excellent questions. So, okay. <laughs> Africa is a diverse 54 nations, right? So many languages and dialects spoken on the African continent that it is mind blowing. I know people think. You know, there's Anglophone Africa, there's Arab-speaking Africa, there's French-speaking Africa, there's Portuguese-speaking Africa, but those are just the European colonial languages and the Arab colonial languages which were brought into Africa. Maybe an avenue or road in for the rest of us to discover this. Country. That's right. Mm -hmm. That's right. But if you kind of look at Africa, cultural variation is its strength. Cultural variation is its beauty. The challenge for Africa is to channel all of the wealth which is coming out of Africa so that the African people benefit from it more. 
so that the African people benefit from it more. The world is benefiting. I got a cell phone. Africa's up in here. Mm -hmm. You know, you got all this technology right here. Africa is up in here. You got rubber on your tires. Africa is up in here. So the, the reality for the future of Africa is how does Africa harness the beauty of all of this cultural diversity, all of these different levels of development, these different economic terrains, these different relationships with other places in the world for the benefit of Africa. Right now, today, China is the largest trading partner with Africa. Bam! Okay, that's different, right? We think in the U.S. is the main dog around the house. No, <laughs> that is not happening. But hopefully not the only trading partner of Africa, <laughs> given yeah. the well, economic realities of China this week. That's right, that's we're right. Not actually and talking about, but. But, but, you're right. but I'm saying for Africa, yeah. this has been, been the reality. But it's economic relationship with the United States, it's economic relationship with the EU, all of these, it's economic relationships with the Middle East, all of these interactions and entanglements with Africa are very important because it is one world. And Africa should not be thinking of, well, we're going to be independent from the rest of the world, put a bubble around Africa and just you know, live on our resources. Do you Not find, going to happen. Do you find people in Africa thinking that? Not many, especially okay. those who understand right. global economics, politics, and culture. They know that Africa is intimately engaged with the rest of the world. So the question becomes, how does Africa harness this interaction with the rest of the world so that it's more beneficial to Africa? That will require more unified action. That will require more African nations working together right. as economic blocks, as political blocks. That would require Africa kind of harnessing its cultural beauty, flavor, and letting the world experience that more. So it, it's a huge task. I mean, when you read just one book about, uh, like, what was that one, What is the What? Uh, <laughs> Do you remember? What, what, is that I don't remember. Keep going. Okay. But I mean, that that's the story of one African uh, refugee making his way out of harm's way and, and all the way back once he had come to the U.S., made some money going back and starting a, a clinic. Um, or, or the Confessions of an Economic Hitman, the Perkins one, which I, I was brought to mind of reading the first little bit of your book um, about the economic restructuring deals that... Uh, international uh, money yeah. IMF put together yeah. all through our lifetimes now. And nobody's saying would accept that stuff. Exactly. Look what happened in Greece. Exactly. They tried to do that in Greece. The Greek people were like, y'all crazy? Yeah, really. Thank you. You see? But on Africa, they forced these structural readjustment programs on Africa, and they basically destroyed many African uh, economies and tied them more into a relationship of dependency. Well, putting people in the in the what we used to be called the third world into a cash economy. Yes. When most of their back and forth was tribal based, uh, you know, in, interactions with people who had gone back centuries doing similar kinds of uh, interactions. <laughs> All right. So, uh, you know, it, it's it's an incredible thing that that Africa is in as good a shape it is. Well, Africa was integrated into the modern economy brutally. Thank you. Okay, we're going to take a little station break here. You are listening to WLUW 88.7 Chicago Sound Alliance. You're listening to The Live from the Heartland Show. And to Fuku, I, uh, I would like to ask you about uh, Kwame Nkrumah. Kwame Nkrumah is talked about in your book. He uh, says his name okay. <laughs> Could I blow it again? Yeah, you did. <laughs> I'm used to it. I'm looking yeah, I'm at it. <laughs> to Fuku. I'm used to it from him. To I'm used to it from him. Oh, I got it spelled wrong here is why I'm looking at yeah. T-U-F-U-K-U. -U, well, there you go. All right. <laughs> Anyhow, Kwame Nkrumah in Ghana was a hell of a guy. Uh, and uh, he went to Lincoln University, which a lot of people don't know about here in the United States. Um, and he was, uh, you know, the president of Ghana when it emerged. I wonder if you just talk a little about him. We know a lot about Nelson Mandela. We hear about other people, but uh, I always liked Kwame Nkrumah. <laughs> you know, Nkrumah was one of the most important leaders uh, in the 20th century. And, you know, I'm not trying to make him a god or an idol because he's a man, so he had faults. 
Okay, and that he was a man where everybody know he had some faults because men come with their problems. Uh -huh. But he was a great man in what he did and what he said. So in Kruma, on the eve of African independence, on the eve of the independence of Ghana in 1957, said that Ghana's freedom is meaningless. Okay, the independence of Ghana is meaningless unless it is tied into the total liberation and unification of the African continent. Now that's very important because there was independence already in Egypt, already in Sudan, already in Libya, already in several places, but it was here that Nkrumah said, no, this is a movement to liberate the entire continent and to bring it all together for economic, political, and cultural strength. So Nkrumah was a great in that he did that. When Martin Luther King Jr. came back from the inauguration of Kwame Nkrumah in 1957, he gave a very important speech called, ironically, the birth of a nation. Mm -mm -mm. And he came back and he said, now, because you know, this, this is on the heels of the Montgomery bus boycott, mm -hmm. yeah. the successful right. Montgomery bus boycott. And so here is um, um, Martin Luther King Jr. saying, what I have learned from Kwame Nkrumah and his writings on strategies for fighting is that we have just begun. Don't just sit in the back of the bus. Don't just sit in the front of the bus. We have to continue this struggle. So Nkrumah was that kind of inspirational character. And so he continued to be that kind of inspirational character. He was one of the champions of the independence of the Congo, one of the colleagues of Patrice Lumumba. And so another you know, guy we don't hear about much. Another guy we we stop talking about these yeah. guys because these freedom fighters were fighting for the things we say we love. We say we love justice. We say we love democracy. We say we love freedom. Well, it, it's it's complicated because of that that none of these people are perfect. Exactly. And so you've got violence uh, both uh, in the course of the liberation struggle, um, but also violence uh, that is against women uh, or against other tribes that, you know, have a historic... Uh, well, you may want to address tribalism as, a, as, a, as I mean, a, how do we handle feature. that? It's a big feature, and the only way we can handle it is for Africans to tell us how to, basically. Yeah. You know, and this is a, this is a real issue for yeah, Africa, is the problem of this tradition of ethnic and religious conflict. Right. Now, where does this tradition come from? <laughs> you know, so this tradition in part... The beating heart of man. <laughs> the beating heart. But look, part of this tradition, Kagame wrote in, in 2014, Kagame wrote an editorial for the New York Times, and he wrote it, Kagame, President Kagame is, is uh, president of Rwanda, okay? So he was writing about where did this fight between the Hutu and the Tutsis come from? Mm -hmm. And he said, we didn't have this fight before Belgium came. We didn't even know we were different before the Belgians came. We know we had some differences in dialect. We knew some people worked here, some people worked there. Some people had this mountain, other people had that mountain. But we didn't even have all of this, this way of competing and fighting with each other. But the Belgians come in, now I'm a Hutu and I'm this. Now I'm a Tutsi and I'm this. And after a few years of that, you begin to internalize the distinction and the competition over resources in a way which is negative. Now, I'm not saying that Africa didn't have tribes before Europeans. Oh, I'm just saying that the nature of the conflict was changed as a consequence of colonialism. We, we you know, in to, the we have to assume that that they got along peacefully in in some of those places. You know, yeah, in, in, in the some book, of them they had war too. Yeah. In the book, African Independence: How Africa Shapes the World, to Kufu Zubiri, you. Uh, talk a lot, a lot about early on about W.E.B. Du Bois and people should be reminded who he is but there were all these Pan-Africa conferences that went along and there was a lot of unity going forward but then when the actual independence uh, came to many countries there were a lot of different splits there were different regions some were more conservative than others and how much was that uh, an extension of European colonialism how much of it was uh, internal conflicts going way back a little Mike, bit on that. Here's the sequence. World War II. Africans, millions of Africans, Walking. sacrificed their lives to protect democracy that they did not have at home. 
millions of Africans. Then they return home to what? Old fashioned colonialism? Be serious, baby. And the French just beat them up when they tried to collect their severance pay yes. or their, you know, the deal. It was terrible. It was, it was, they were rioting, they were fighting all over the African continent. Now, the Pan African uh, movement was very important, began towards the end of the, uh, the 19th century, but accelerated all the way up to the 5th Pan African Congress in 1945, which coincided with the end of World War II with the creation of the UN, with the Universal Declaration of Independence, and with the acceleration of the international movement for independence in India, independence in Vietnam, independence in Korea, independence in Indonesia, and all over Africa, this fire started to burn. Now, it is fundamentally important to recognize that it also coincided with the rise of the Cold War. Mm -hmm. And the Cold War was the enemy of African freedom and independence. Because Africans were, to, you had to choose which side you're going to be on. You couldn't say, well, I want to be on my side. They said, you don't have a side. You're going to either be on the western side or the eastern side. You're going to either be for capitalism or you're going to be for socialism. And the socialists really weren't doing that much unless you were in armed struggle because they had their own economic problems to deal with. But they supported it. China was there. Soviet Union was there supporting the independence movements while we in the U.S. supported dictators. We did. Supported uh, corruption. Yeah, we supported all of these things just so they'd say, I'm on your side. That fostered a kind of leadership which represented not the people's interests, but the interests of which side they were on in the Cold War. One last question. Uh, I didn't read the whole book. I read a bunch of it. Uh, do you ever mention Ben Bella? Because a lot of people saw the movie Battle of Algiers, uh, you know, which was part of the independence struggles, and we did not, uh, and a lot of people don't know about Ben Bella. He ended up disappearing. I wonder if he comes up in the book. He comes up in the book okay. because he is important. I mean, here is a, a, a very significant figure who is doing what he has to do to change the political face of Algeria. Algeria, you, you gotta remember, now in 19, no, in 18, before he came and Alex de Tocqueville, before he came and wrote that book on democracy uh, in, in America, America, he wrote a memo to the French government about why, yeah. why they needed to colonize Algeria. Yeah. And he goes, come over here talking about democracy That's so the legacy of that involuntarism yeah. so all of that kind of you you know kind of fast forward up to Ben Bella and these guys who fought in World War II hero in World War II dang uh, okay. can I ask one final final it, question you yeah live it up well then <laughs> I'm gonna do one thing after you that go ahead Tom go which ahead. is as an historian how do you think people will look back at this era of social upheaval and social movements, and I'm thinking particularly Pulse Ferguson of Black Lives Matters and okay. what we're seeing domestically. What is your reference point of deep being deeply seeped in, in independence movements in Africa? How does that frame your understanding about what's going on right now? I love the activism. I love freedom fighters fighting to change the world. Black Lives Matter, you got my heart, my spirit, everything. I'm with you on the hashtag, and I'm with you every time you disrupt the foolishness that's out there. I am with right you, okay? I am opposed to the tyranny of the U.S. criminal justice system. I am opposed to the tyranny of the prison industrial complex. Those things are bad and they make the U.S. look bad and they make the prospects for peace, unity, and progress as we fight for more equality economically, politically, and in every other way in this country. We need to learn from the African independence movement. We need to learn from the civil rights movement. We need to learn from the black power movement. And one thing is clear from those movements, an essential attribute for success is organization. Is organization. Okay. It is good to protest, but right you got on. to organize and Ow. negotiate and Ow. fight with Ow. power. Dude, Kufu Zuberi, my God, it's great to have you. We could we could do a whole hour with you. A couple. Have, Two, have, three, four. Uh, we have three uh, guys sitting in the waiting room out there, men of soul. Fantastic. Uh, 
from the Black Ensemble Theater. But uh, where do people find How Africa Shapes the World, your book? You can find it at tukufuzuberi.com, T-U-K-U-F-U-Z-U-B-E-R-I.com, tukufuzuberi.com, T-U-K-U-F-U-Z-U-B-E-R.com. I printed out your selected chronology of events in the back of the book because yes. the history of Africa is the history of the world. Yes. And uh, it would be good for us to start learning about it. Bless you for helping us do Thank so. you. Thank you so much for having me.